357. For those that uh, want to turn there, I've been sending pictures back to my wife, and she said, if you ever go back, I'm going. So I said, I'm holding you to that. She doesn't get to go a lot, but uh, I would love for her to love to her to enjoy Alaska. Brother Scott, I really do think I could live up here. That's an inside joke. <clears throat> Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he received the early and the latter rain. Our title is Perusia, the imminent return of our Lord. Would you pray with me this morning? God, we thank you, Lord. We ask you, God, to help us this morning. Open our understanding. Help us to receive what it is that you have. I pray for the rhema word of God. Lord, I pray, Lord, you anoint each and every one of us to understand, to see. God, we give you glory. We give you praise. We give you honor. We pray that your will is completed in this house with each and every one of us this morning in Jesus' name. Why don't you give him a hand clap of praise as you're seated. <laughs> Hallelujah. The coming of our Lord, Perusia, means day of our Lord or our Lord cometh. The word is used for both the rapture of the church and his second coming. It simply means the presence of God. It's the future visible return from heaven of Jesus to take his bride, the church, to live eternally in heaven with him. 2 Thessalonians 2.3 is talking about Jesus returning in clouds. This is not the end of time. There are still events to fulfill. This is his return back to take his bride home. 1 Thessalonians 4.17 is a meeting between the bride and and the bridegroom in the air. The Bible gives us many signs to know the season of his return. Signs that tell the one watching, waiting, anticipating his return, look up, your redemption draweth nigh. The signs of his imminent return continue to unfold daily around the world. A meeting that was to take place in May between Germany and Israel was canceled due to rising frustration in Berlin because of settlement activity in the West Bank. The article continues, relations have grown tense in recent years as Germany questions Prime Minister Netanyahu's commitment to a two-state solution with the Palestinians. Gog Magog continues to quietly form. No one is really paying attention. Several news agencies, including the New York Times, report the forming of a shadow government organization in the U.S. named Organizing for Action, or OFA. This organization, with 250 chapters across America, over 5 million strong, are fighting for progressive change. That is their website explanation. This is a well-funded protest movement that has beefed up and ramped up recruitment of young liberal activists. There, there is so much news of government catastrophe. Which news report do we use to illustrate the chaos in government is the question. But it's not just ours. It's governments around this world. The point, there is nothing settling down. Things continue in a chaotic state, an atmosphere of confusion. America has become the drama queen nation. Don't put it past the enemy. Part of his plan is to keep people so fixated on drama that they miss the signs of Christ's return. Although the drama is part of the, the signs. People, so-called Christians, continue their love affair, hanging on, clinging to, not letting go of this rotten age environment that surrounds us. Individuals are deceived beyond rational thinking. Matthew 24, 24, if it were possible, 
the false Christ and prophets with signs and wonders would deceive the very elect. The spirit of Antichrist manipulates the deception of humanity so much that even many of the most steadfast saints are being deceived. And God's long suffering so that all will have the opportunity to become to come to, to repentance. How many are lost in the delay of his return? And I'm not questioning God. He knows what he's doing. I am saying, how many do you know that once had stellar walks with God? that now have shallow to no relationship with him. It's time people pay attention to scripture and recognize what time it is. What can be shaken is literally being shaken. Matthew 24, 22, Jesus reached the conclusion that if days were not shortened, there wouldn't be anybody to save because how, of how great the deception becomes. We must be careful how we rationalize and justify during this hour. There is a point God says enough, and he takes his bride out of this crazy, messed up world. Now, Pastor, in this next little segment here, I'm not suggesting or promoting wine drinking, okay? Boy, it got quiet right there for sure. Israel, Israel Today headlines re read recently. Does Israel's booming wine industry signal Messiah's return? And this is Israel today. Their headlines. The article reads, a seemingly minor event occurred recently that could have enormous prophetic significance. The renewed Sanhedrin, the Jewish religious court, took del delivery of 30 bottles of wine. No big deal, right? Not until you read Micah 4.4. 4. Now, this is all in the article. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree. None shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts hath spoken it. That verse is in the middle of prophecy concerning the Mesonaic age. It suggests Israel would be producing wine. For centuries, the, the Holy Land was under Muslim rule. And alcohol is forbidden in Islam. No one produced wine in the land of Israel unless they were looking for severe punishment. Thus the fear mentioned in Micah 4.4. 4. Only with the rebirth of Israel as a nation has wine again been produced by Israel. And the significant part. It's only recent, recently that Israel's wine industry has grown large enough for the Sanhedrin to find wine kosher enough to be used in the temple that religious Jews hope will soon be rebuilt in Jerusalem. Wine in the temple service must meet far higher kosher standards than that suitable for everyday consumption. Now they've found such a wine, and it's Israel's. Indeed, Christ's return is imminent. One more small piece of puzzle falls into place. Now the little things, the, the stuff that are, the final parts are fitting into place. It's like building a house. All the big stuff goes together quickly. Then comes the tedious, the finishing touches. Now it's the little things, the tailoring of the priest's robes for the third temple. Finished. The DNA research to make sure the priests are from the right lineage, the Levite perfect bloodline done. The wine with a high-end standard quality ready. The solid gold menorah weighing a half ton valued at $3 million. I was in Israel a few years ago, and they were in the final uh, – they, were, they, they still had just a little bit. They were still trying to figure out just one or two little details we were told, in building this menorah because it had been such a research to figure out how to do it in one piece without there not being anything. It, it, it all had to be perfect in one piece where everything could, the oil could flow through it, all the different things could happen with it. But now they've got that menorah. It's, it's crafted as one piece exactly by 
biblical standard and measurements. It's finished. It's on display alongside the Western Wall and the Temple Mount. It's built exclusively to be used in the third temple. The signs, the little things, coming at such a rapid rate, stacking on top of each other, spilling out all over the world. There, you, you can't keep up with how much is taking place and coming together. And on the other side of the signs, the signs are warnings to those not ready. People numbed, shackled, chained in prisons of confusion because they will not believe truth. They believe the enemy's lies. They're sent strong delusion, continuing in their disillusionment that all is okay. Those attempting to help individuals see spiritually are simply labeled judgmental. If time wasn't shortened, even the very elect would scarcely be saved. It's a very real reality. Jim Rogers' investment guru recently wrote an article predicting the death of cash and total government control of spending. He goes on to say that government is always looking out for themselves. There have been many predictions like this by many different investment companies and financial advisors like Rogers in years past, but the difference now is India's economy ranks number seven in the world. India is becoming cashless. India has withdrawn 86% of its cash from the market, forcing individuals to use cashless transactions. It's illegal in India to spend over $4,000 in cash on a transaction. In France, you can't use more than 1,000 euro per transa uh, cash transaction. All other transactions have to be cashless. Many other countries are doing the same. In some states in the U.S., you can't make cash transactions above certain amounts. It's claimed to be done for the public good. The track tracking of expenditures has crept into everyday life. Example, you buy a cup of coffee, you, you pay for it, it's processed electronically. You, it's processed through databases connected to your information. They know how much you're drinking, where you're buying it, etc. You're tracked, you don't even realize it. I was in our new Kroger's uh, grocery store the other day and the guy checking me out wanted me to join Kroger's frequent customer club and of course I wasn't interested because I don't go to grocery stores very much. When I declined he commented what a genius move it was at Kroger's by the Kroger's marketing team. Joining the club he said tracks customers, gives information to market you better by numbering its customers. It's all around us. People don't get it. Now you're marketed better so is the government claim. Government loves it, though, through seemingly in innocent plans labeled marketing. Government controls you better, greater. They track you. It's leading to a cashless society. Eventually, this world lasts long enough. You won't do your own tax returns. They'll be done for you. They'll have your transactions. They'll have your records. It'll all be automated because all your transactions will have been electronic. The tax you owe will be debited, debited from, from or charged to one of your cards automatically without cash changing hands. Your taxes will be completed perfectly. No tax fraud eliminates crime. Before that scenario takes place, you can bank on the day, filing your taxes, not having the option of paying by check. Those funds will be paid electronically. We're practically there anyway. Now, Obamacare has not gone away in it is a clause that makes chipping mandatory in 2018. Now this is something that has been mandatory. I think starting back it was going to be mandatory 2012 maybe and then it was moved to another year and now we're at 2018 with it. So it's, it'll be interesting to see what happens with this clause. I do know that it's just we're almost to the point that we're, you're, you're going to have to have a passport port to even fly between states. Many nations are already chipping their military, especially special forces. The state of Indiana started chipping its state troopers several years ago by voluntary chipping. 
a company in Wisconsin started shipping their employees just a few weeks ago so they would have the convenience of entering secured areas, using the copier, paying for snacks in the break room, etc., through scanning. Convenience. It'll be sold to the world through convenience. Different companies around the world are chipping their employees for the convenience of scanning through security systems, operating printers, paying for company orders with the swipe of a hand. We're way down the road to a cashless society, a one world government, the new world order moving toward the mark of the beast, but very few pay attention to exactly what really is going on. If you want to live in this world, its culture of doom and gloom, you go right ahead. As for me and my house, we're looking for a rapture. We're looking We're living in the apostolic book of Acts, culture of miracles, signs, and wonders. I'm looking for the new Jerusalem. I've got my mind and my eyes fixed on Jesus. I'm watching the eastern skies to appear, for him to appear in clouds of glory. Is there anybody in the house? Would you give him a hand clap of praise? Hallelujah. Eminence, as it relates to Bible prophecy, simply means that the return of Jesus Christ for the church can happen at any moment. No warning signs, no short-term countdown. We watchers remain on alert 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Matthew 24, 37 through 51 explains many things that will be taking place at the rapture of the church. Matthew 24, 37 says, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also be the coming of the Son of Man. Genesis 6, 5 through 12 describes Noah's day as the earth was filled with wickedness and the hearts of man were evil. Luke 17, 28 says, Likewise, as in the days of Lot. Jude 1, 7 explains Lot's days as a day of great immorality and an abomination. It takes no imagination to understand that we are living in days comparable to Lot and Noah. 2438, Matthew 2438, for as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, they were giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. Adam Clark's commentary explains verse 38 as, They spent their time in plundering, rioting, and luxury. I believe that you can agree there is plenty of plunder by groups bent on destruction of property and rioting because of their agendas. Worldwide, not just our nation. And at no other time in the history of earth has there been as many as there are, are today living in luxury. Here about a week, here the week before I came up here, I'm talking to my neighbor. He said, man, I got a crazy story to tell you. I said, okay. He said, uh, my brother, both of, the, both of the, these guys are coaches. He said, my brother had some of these Magellan pants, this fishing wear and stuff. You unzip the, he zipped the legs out and all. He said he had a bunch of that stuff. And he, he always saw this homeless guy. And so he, he said, I'm going to put that all together. And I'm going to take it and give it to him. So he did. He put it all in a sack, took it, gave it to the guy. And he said, hey, man, I see you every day. And he said, I just wanted, thought I'd, I'd bless you with this, let you have this. So he gave it to him. Two days later, he's pumping gas at the same gas station where he sees a guy quite often and uh, the guy walks up to him hands him the bag and says this is not my style he said here's your clothes back here's my point people now you know I'm this is not a knock against homeless people I, I promise you it's not a knock it's a, in fact it's it's fantastic that we are this way but our homeless, many of our homeless, 
are better off than what a lot of third world nations that I've gone to and visited. You, you, you understand what I'm saying? It goes with this verse that I'm talking about. Never has there been a day when people are so increased with goods and need of nothing more than today. And it, it's just another, it, when, it, when he was telling me this story, I was thinking to myself, we really do live in a land of plenty. Now, I understand there's some that have more than others. But if you will just be truthful and honest with yourself, we've never lived in a day where people have it so good, even from the poorest. And I know that's hard to say and hard to believe and all that. I'm just saying, if you look at it compared to what it was years and years ago, it's fulfillment of the scripture is what my point is. But in Matthew 40, 24, 39, they knew, or not, knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also be the coming of the Son of Man. People were caught unsuspecting. Why? Because of what I just talked about. They're not looking. They weren't looking for the flood. They're not wasn't watching for the flood. Individuals are looking are not looking for a rapture. Many are religious. But the doctrine of the imminent return of Christ has been hijacked. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the meal, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Verse 40 and 41 expresses that individuals that know each other, work together, are friends, see each other every day, probably have discussed religion, may go to the same church together. Scripture says, uh, two in bed. Husband and wife. One believes the other doesn't. Maybe has rationalized, has justified their lifestyle living outside of biblical principles. One possibly has allowed bitterness or anger, resentment, whatever. Countless offenses to keep them from believing. One is taken, the other left. What a tragedy. Watch therefore, for you know not what our your Lord doth come. Not knowing proves his imminent return. Not knowing explains it could happen at any moment. Not knowing is an enemy of the unsaved. Not knowing but ready proves one's allegiance to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I don't know about you, but I want to be ready. Matthew 24, 43, but know this, that if the goodman of the house had known and what watched the thief would come, he would have watched, would not have suffered his house to be broken up. If we knew, if we understood all that is coming after the rapture, all that eternity holds, all the good of heaven and the terror of hell, we would watch and we would not allow his coming to happen to us unaware. There would be nothing that would stop us from being saved. Hallelujah. Matthew 24, 44, Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. That, to me, is the most scariest verse in the Bible. In an hour you think not, Christ returns to take his bride home. Again, eminence is described in not knowing when, but in the fact that he could return at any moment. Finally, a warning to the one that does not understand God's delay of his return. They become slothful. They, they're lulled to sleep. They're blinded to the hour. God's delay is about everyone having the opportunity to repent. An eternity of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Hell awaits the one that gives themselves over to a life where they have written their own rules. Too many individuals have forgotten how infallible the Word of God is. It's not a book of compromise. It's, how, it's, it's, it's an intolerant book. How set in His ways God is. There's no compromise there. It doesn't matter what you or I think. It doesn't matter what we've deemed and, we, and, and what we have decided it says. 
What matters is what the Word of God says, how it says it, and I've got to line up with it. I believe completely in grace. I am a recipient of it, but I also understand judgment. When you think about it, nothing in this life, every victory in this life comes with a planned, purposed course. It doesn't happen by accident. Why would you think gaining heaven would come with any, with any looser criteria when gaining heaven is everything? I'm looking for a city whose creator and maker is God. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. When I look upon his face, does anybody want to see Jesus? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 16, 22, If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, maranatha. Maranatha is an Aramaic phrase, which means our Lord cometh. Maranatha was a watchword for the early church. It's a watchword for the end time church. It expresses a hope that forms the basis of our experience with Christ. There are those that object to the connecting of anathema, which is explained Jesus as a curse with Maranatha. This associates the curse with our Lord cometh. Such objections overlook the fact that the worst condition of the one out of relationship with Christ occurs at the coming of the Lord. As we study 1 Corinthians 12, 3, we find very sobering information. It's very clear. It says it right there, but it's easily overlooked. No man is able to say, Lord Jesus, except he be infilled with the Holy Ghost. Only then is it accepted. You want to know how important your body that was made to be the temple of the Holy Ghost be filled with the Holy Ghost is? The answer is right there in that verse. Anathema means accursed, a gift that has been rejected. Paul is saying that no one can say, while speaking in the Spirit, that Jesus was an unacceptable gift, but neither does he really know whether he was an acceptable sacrifice unless he has the Spirit. Paul tells us in Romans 5.15 that grace was a free gift. Unless an individual has been through the process of sal the salvation plan and he's received the God's Spirit, he cannot say because he does not intimately really know whether Jesus really is Lord and for it to be accepted. There is revelation, a heightened enlightenment that comes with speaking in other tongues. The salvation plan according to Acts 2 is you must be born of water and spirit Speaking in other tongues as Jesus gives the utterance, buried, baptized in Jesus' name. There is no other name under heaven whereby we can be saved. He is a jealous God. Speaking in another language is heaven's language. It's a gift Jesus gives to you, and he speaks through you. It's a supernatural experience, just like feeling the presence of God. Those chill bumps, that warm, fuzzy feeling, the unexplainable emotion that rises up. Healing is a supernatural experience. Being set free is a supernatural experience. But it's not spooky. It's simply God's plan. That is a salvation plan. There is no other. I understand there's never been a mass rapture. Scripture is clear. But of that day and hour, knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. And the very understanding of Matthew 24 and 36, and not knowing the hour of his return, we understand his return is imminent. But 1 Thessalonians 4, 17 tells us, We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. We get the word rapture from the Latin word rapir for the Greek term 1 Thessalonians 4.17 caught up, which is harpazo. Harpazo means to seize, to catch, away, to pluck, to pull, to take away by force, caught up. 
the bride of Christ will be caught up out of this insane world. 1 Corinthians 15, 52 tells us, in a moment and in a twinkling of an eye, we shall be changed. This corruptible shall put on incorruption. This mortal shall put on immortality. Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is thy sting? Grave, where is thy victory? I don't know about you, but I get a little bit excited when I start thinking about Jesus, about the rapture, about streets of gold and walls of jasper. 1 John 3, 2, it doth not yet appear what we shall be but know that when we shall when he shall appear we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is from rags to riches from dying to life eternal from asphalt to gold we will be caught up one day it ain't going to matter what this life has been it won't matter whether you've been homeless whether you've been this, whether you've been that, the richest person in the world. If you've lived for God, you'll walk streets of gold. Those that are watching and waiting are going to be overnight successes. Am I talking to anybody in the house today? It's going to be in a moment and in a twinkling of an eye. No devil in hell can prevail against the church. I'm excited about the promises of God, Brother Mendenhall. We've just got to make up our mind. It don't matter what comes or goes. It don't matter whether she lives for God, whether he lives for God, me and my house, we're going to live for God. I must be saved. I must be saved. I wish somebody would get a tenacity about them today and say, I'm putting aside everything else. There is nothing that's going to stop me from being saved. Give him a hand clap of praise. Second Peter 1.19 explains how. The metaphor is used to describe Christ in 2 Peter 1. It's a bright and morning star. Christ, which is the Holy Spirit, rises in us at the point of rapture, propelling us into a metamorphosis of change from this mortal body into immortality of a glorified body like to Christ. You can do some research and you'll find there's pop of phosphorus in each one of you. Now if you'd go take and swallow phosphorus today, you'd die. But there's phosphorus in each one of us. I shouldn't even went there. I don't have time to explain it. But it links back through the Hebrew and the Greek and all the places. And that is what, that's a combustible thing with the Holy Ghost that rises up in you and it ignites and it propels you out of here. It's, an ex it's going to be more than beam me up Scotty. That's why it's so important to understand why we're here on this earth. When God breathed life into a dirt shell of a man, he built a house. Your job, you may be, your title might be this or that. It could be whatever. But what you're really here for is to be the temple of the Holy Ghost. A conduit that the Holy Ghost can operate through. You were designed to house the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye ha have of God and you're not your own. When we fully understand who we are, why we are the what we are the temple of, the power working in us, we will become unstoppable. That is why in this end time hour, Satan is so bent on stealing that knowledge from you. It does not, he does not want us to be filled with God's Spirit, speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gives utterance, because he knows the power and the revelation you receive with that experience. There's a divine plan. There's a divine plan God came to this earth 
to set in place so that each one of us following that plan would be saved so that we would walk this earth in dominion and authority and power because we followed his plan. There are no mistakes. There's not a mistake sitting on a pew this morning. He makes no mistakes. He's left nothing to happenstance. He knows your beginning. He knows you before you were in your mother's womb. You're in this hour at this time. You are part of the plan for the end time hour to be the church that is part of the end time church. He gives power to the weak. He gives strength to the powerless. Even youths will become weak and tired and young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. You ain't no mistake, baby. God has an exceeding, more bigger plans for you than you can think for yourself. It is his will that every one of us spend eternity with him. It is his will that we walk this earth daily in dominion. In Ephesians 1.19, Paul is saying, I'm praying that you will get the revelation of the incredible greatness of power, of God's power. His resurrection power that raised Christ from the dead. It is that same resurrection power that dwells in you and I according to 1 Corinthians 6.19. That same power that will propel us from this place to that celestial city at the rapture. What an awesome, if we just got it, if we just could get it, what, what we have and who we are and what's dwelling on the inside of us. Throughout the New Testament, there are truths. There's theology, there's doctrine that demonstrates why and how we can live the book of Acts. The early church lived with power and demonstration that Jesus walked with. That same power dwells in you and I. Jesus, living on this earth, lived and ministered as a true man. He, he was showing us what a human being living in relationship with God can live like. It was a book of Acts, church and demonstration in power. The blind saw, the deaf could hear. The lame, lame, lame walked, the dumb talked, the dead lived. Je Jesus said in John 14, 12, I'm going to the Father. Those that believe in me, they're going to see greater miracles, signs, and wonders. We're called in this end time hour to be the church of miracles, signs, and wonders. Acts 2, 17, this is that spoken by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass in the last days. I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. We can live in the apostolic culture of miracles, signs, and wonders. We just have to have a sold-out relationship with him. We must not allow a mixed-up mind to weaken our faith. The outpouring of God's spirit was prophesied by the prophet Joel. 750 years before the first outpouring at Pentecost. Joel also says in those, these verses of Scripture, the latter and the former rain was already given meaning. It's not something we have to pull down from heaven. It's already available. We just need to connect to it for a sovereign demonstration of the Holy Ghost. Is there anybody that believes that in this house today? Hallelujah. Why don't you give him a hand clap of praise? Why don't somebody worship him? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I just read where scientists have found a far off planet they've never seen before, light years away, with an atmosphere which means it possibly has life the thought went through my mind could that be heaven you 
can think I'm crazy, whatever you want to. I really don't care. Because I'm telling you, there's a day, it's not a fable. It's not anything that we've made up. This Bible gives us all the details. There is coming a day. Goodbye, world. Goodbye. Hello, streets of gold. Hello, walls, walls of jasper. Hello, gates of pearl. Hello, Jesus. But while I'm on this earth, all the promises of God, <laughs> all the awesome things that I can experience when I simply put my faith and my trust in Him, and it doesn't matter what comes or goes, what happens, if He's got my back, it don't matter. It don't matter. Folks, when it, now I'm getting really ready to get kind of ignorant on y'all, okay? This is how I got it figured out. I've been through, if y'all hadn't been through anything, my hat's off to you. In fact, where are you living? I'm coming and living with y'all. Because I'm telling you, I've been through some stuff. But, the, but I finally figured out through one of the worst trials I've ever been through, all he can do is kill me. Well, no, that's not true. I didn't say that right. All that could happen is I could die. Okay? If, if God decided, it was my time. And he said, come on up here. Anabunde, hode, Keith, come on up. Let's have your rapture right now. Okay? Well, what happens with that deal? Do I not win? So I win in death. Here's my point. It's only 70 years compared to eternity. If we can ever come to grips with how short this life is, how long is eternity, and what we're simply doing on this earth is we're, we're, we are ambassadors for Him. And all he's doing is hewing away the impurities so that we can be perfected. Amen. If we can ever get that, then this life becomes, here's a word that comes to mind, easy. And y'all, I've been through some stuff. I know, I understand what I'm talking about right now. But it truly does. If we take our eyes off the situation, off the circumstances, and we put them on God. And we say, God, I know you know my ending. You know my beginning from my ending. You know everything that's going on with me. You know everything that's happening. You know all about it. And Jesus, there is coming a day, whether I die in you or whether I go in a rapture, I'm going to be with you. And there's nothing that's going to stop that from happening. Why don't we stand to our feet this morning? Why don't you continue to clap for him right there? Why don't you continue to praise him a minute? Why don't you continue to love him? Because he's worthy of every bit of it. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm just going to ask everyone here today, why don't you come around the front before we leave? Now, I don't know everything there is to know about you. There may be someone here that needs a Holy Ghost that I talked about a little bit. You haven't ever spoken in tongues. You haven't received the Holy Ghost. There may be somebody here that's never been baptized in the name of Jesus. All of those things are... It's not that you have to, which you, you need to do that, but it's that you get to. It's, it's such an awesome deal. But the, and there may be somebody here that's fighting financial situations illness there may be situations here that are marital any number of things but as I, as I tried to explain today while we're here on this earth God is taking care of us you, pastor mentioned it the sparrow he clothes the birds the animals he takes care of them. He takes care of us. He gives us everything we need. We have such a promise in the rapture of the church that I think it's going to happen. I, I talked about the imminence of it, of it, of it happening. 
at any moment and I believe it but at the same time that we talk about the rapture we also know his promises and the reality is is the the day that we're living in and what we're fighting and what we're up against today and so before we leave the here this morning I want you to grab that person's hand beside you you know what I just feel this morning why don't we repent but after we get through repenting then I want you to start praying for your neighbor I believe in the power of praying for each other when you pray for others you get what you need because God knows your needs so right now let's just pour out our heart to God for a moment why don't we all get right with him why don't we say Lord search my heart see if there be any wicked way in me God see if there be anything Lord that is not of you why don't we do that for a moment God you see me Lord you know everything about me Lord you know my coming in and my going out you know all there is to know and Jesus I'm praying right now that you search me God 